ties all the dots together and all the connections makes all the connections on exactly these people the big players that we've been seeing in this whole pandemic fiasco so here is the amazing Polly I have a boom for you today it all started with this tweet COVID-19 ethical challenges for nurses at the Hastings Center and I noticed that all of these people's names got highlighted which means that they have a Twitter account except for this person Christine Grady and I thought well who might she be we discussed three major challenges from a nursing perspective safety of self and others allocation of scarce resources and relationships Christine Grady is not even on Twitter who is she I thought Christine Grady happens to work for the National Institute of Health. And she is the chief of bioethics and the head of the section on human subjects research. Whoa, I didn't even know that that department existed. Human subjects research department of the National Institutes of Health. Hmm. All right. That was the first thing I found out about Christine Grady. Let's see what else she's writes a lot of academic papers a lot and she's written a book search for an AIDS vaccine that was in 1995 one of her most interesting papers that she wrote she co-authored with another guy in 2005 called four paradigms of clinical research and research oversight that she goes through medical research on human subjects over the course of the last 80 years or so since World War II and she categorizes the phases that they've gone through and where she ends up is that in 2005 we were getting into a communitarian based paradigm of of human research subjects and what she essentially means is they've made it so that the general public feels like it is their duty as humans to possibly sacrifice their own lives for medical research they don't even have to buy people anymore like pay them they don't have to have people who are sick they have now done such a mind job on the general public that they can convince a lot of perfectly healthy people to come in and let them experiment on them for free for the good of humanity that's where Christine Grady's head is at in terms of her ethics and also Christine Grady in 2017 gave a talk at the National Institute of Health about the framework for the ethics of research with human subjects. Well, I just told you uh, where her head is at. And in the 2017 version, it's practically a copy of that 20, 2005 article that she wrote, but updated, updated terminology. I don't believe she uses the word communitarian anymore because people know what that means. It's a weird kind of uh, it's a weird kind of communism where you've talked people into doing it uh, through psychological uh, pressure and things like this and training and conditioning presidential commission for the study of bioethical issues look at that she was on the president's commission from 2010 so appointed by Obama and she was finished there in 2017 I don't know what the story is behind her departure but like I said she was still giving speeches and everything about her chosen topic in 2017 and then all of a sudden she was gone so that's Christine Grady's professional background I wanted to learn a little bit more about her family and I found her sister wouldn't you know this Christine Grady's sister was involved in one of the embassy bombings here she is here Joanne Husky this is a from a YouTube video from Voice of Africa so the story is that she's married to this guy James L Husky who happened to be the second secretary at the embassy in Nairobi Kenya in 1998 she went there that day the day of the bombing supposedly to have her children get tested uh, to be approved to go to school in Kenya and she says she parked her car she walked into the building had just gone down the stairs to the medical area and the bomb went off and it knocked her and her children to the floor it was perfectly black she couldn't see anything there were uh, her husband was apparently in the building they found each other somehow and went outside into the parking lot and she noticed even her car was just a black shell she said 
Almost like her car had the bomb in it. I don't know. But uh, I'm not suggesting that. But that's the story that she tells. Isn't that interesting? And the husband, of course, is just as pivotal to look at as the sister. So James L. Husky's LinkedIn page is here. And we can see that from 2012 to present, he's been a consultant in international affairs at colleges and universities, but more importantly, at the U.S. Department of State. So now he's just not on the payroll, he's a contractor. At the Department of State, James Husky, so Christine Grady's brother-in-law, reviews diplomatic correspondence and documents for release via Freedom of Information Act requests. Okay, so he is the choke point for information getting out into the public, for anything the State Department might do, especially the ambassadors. And it's funny because who is one of the ambassadors? I mean, ambassadors have played a pivotal role in one or two particular big news items. Since Trump's gotten elected, I can think immediately of Marie Ivanovich from Ukraine and Sondland and other diplomats and ambassadors, right? And Christine Grady's sister's husband, her brother-in-law, works right now reviewing diplomatic correspondence and documents for release via Freedom of Information Act requests. Very interesting. And then when you go back in time in Husky's career, you can see Department of State, he was Director of Crisis Management, Deputy Director, Office of Global Systems. He was a diplomat in residence at Georgetown University, Deputy Director, Office of East Asia Regional Security at the U.S. Department of State between 99 and 2002. Seems like a little thing called the September 11th bombings happened right in the middle of that. And then going all the way back to 1996 is when he started at the embassy in Nairobi, Kenya. That's quite the background so far for Christine Grady. She's head of human subjects research and medical ethics at NIH, was on the President's Medical Ethics Commission from, for seven years starting in 2010. Christine Grady's sister is connected directly to a person who's been in the Department of State for since 1996. She's written a book called The Search for an AIDS Vaccine and her ethics are communitarian minded. Does she have any correct connection to Bill Gates? That would be the burning question, wouldn't it? If I could find Christine Grady sitting on the board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or something like that, well, I could not find any such connection. Who is Christine Grady married to? Any guesses? I won't keep you in suspense. Christine Grady is married to Anthony Fauci. What? Are you kidding? My jaw dropped when I saw that. Christine Grady, head of bioethics and human experimentation at the NIH, is married to Anthony Fauci, who also works at the NIH and is head of the Coronavirus Response Task Force. Boom. Boom. And who needs a direct connection between Christine Grady and Bill Gates when you know all we know about Anthony Fauci's own connections to Bill Gates? Now, there's newspaper articles and television spots out there right now claiming that Anthony Fauci, no, Anthony Fauci is not on the board of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Well, that's true. He's not. But that's an obfuscation on the part of the news. That's how they lie. They don't outright lie to you. They just frame it in such a way that they can set up a straw man and defeat the straw man. The straw man's never a true assertion in the first place. What people know is that Anthony Fauci is connected in a myriad ways to Bill Gates. Here's just two of them for the sake of brevity. Because From Philanthropy News Daily in 2002, in this article, which is called Gates Foundation Names New Director of Global Health Program, they mention that that position went to Dr. Richard D. Klausner. But they mention further down in the article that along with Dr. Richard D. Klausner, Another man will be overseeing the creation and development of the Vaccine Research Center, and that man is Dr. Anthony Fauci. There's one connection going all the way back to 2002, and a second one 
very significantly is from this Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation website press release from 2010. Global health leaders launch decade of vaccines collaboration. New York, the World Health Organization, UNICEF, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have announced a collaboration for the decade of vaccines. The leadership council there is comprised of Margaret Chan, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and others. So who needs a direct connection when you've got a marriage partner that can have that connection for you and obscure it? Don't forget, Anthony Fauci is also the person who created PEPFAR. That's a HIV AIDS a funding mechanism from the U.S. government through the U.S. State Department to this other entity called PEPFAR. Bill and Melinda Gates have benefited greatly from funding that goes through PEPFAR. Oh yeah, and before I forget, you guys, if you've been watching me for a while, already know this, but not only did Anthony Fauci create PEPFAR, but the current head of PEPFAR is Deborah Burks. And as you probably know, Anthony Fauci and Deborah Birx are the two people in charge of the coronavirus task force response in the United States. So isn't that cozy? And who stands to benefit if a vaccine gets approved for the COVID-19 response? Bill Gates. Here is a clip of Bill Gates, a couple of clips probably, of Bill Gates talking about his vaccine dreams for COVID-19. Note how he seems to understand that the world is being pressured right now in every way, economically, socially, uh, fear with fear that they're going to get sick. They can't see their loved ones. We're all under this right now. So he knows we're kind of hostage. We know he knows how badly everybody wants their lives to be given back to them, their freedom to be given back to them, their choices to be given back to them. But he seems to think, I mean, you can see it on his face. He knows how this works to his advantage because generally vaccines take, they can take 50 years to develop. Even more recent vaccines took 17 years, things like that, for hep B and things like that. They want to do this in a year, but they know they can't get away with it unless people crave it. And we crave it because they are currently ruining our lives. And I think Bill Gates knows it. Look at his face when he talks about this stuff. Stop people going across borders very dramatically these next few years till we get to that full vaccination. So we'll have a lot of unusual measures mm -hmm. until we get the world vaccinated. You know, 7 billion people, that's a tall order, mm -hmm. but it is, it is where we need to get to. When will there be a vaccine? People like myself and Tony Fauci are saying 18 months. If everything went perfectly, we could do slightly better than that, but there will be a trade-off. We'll have less safety testing. We'll have less safety testing than we typically would have. And so governments will have to decide, you know, do they indemnify the companies and really say, let's let's go out with this uh, when it's, we just don't have the time to do what we normally do. You can run into safety issues. So we're gonna have to take something that usually takes five or six years and get it done in 18 months. If you wanna wait and see if a side effect shows up two years later, uh, that takes two years. How could this ever conceivably be seen as being ethical? And do you think this constitutes human subjects research? To put out a vaccine like the one they want now, which has never been tried before, it has never been tried before, this RNA vaccine. It's very dangerous, especially to rush it this way and to try to force it on people, to try to take away our choices. How is this ethical? Well, I guess it helps when a longtime partner of yours, if you're Bill Gates, your longtime partner, Dr. Anthony Fauci of the NIH, happens to be married to the person who is in charge of bioethics and human experimentation at the NIH, I guess it helps. 
In her 2017 presentation that she gave on the framework for the ethics of research with human subjects, Christine Grady, in her disclaimer, says, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. <laughs> well, that doesn't seem very true to me. She herself may not be connected to vaccine manufacturers or foundations which benefit from being able to experiment on human subjects. However, as I've shown you, her husband does. Just look at all these overlapping interests right here. Just her book alone, which was published in May 22, 1995, and was about an analysis of the naughty ethical problems involved in human subjects research as it pertains to HIV vaccines and the AIDS epidemic. That came out in 1995. Well, in 1996, her husband, Anthony Fauci, presents NIAID strategy for HIV vaccine development. The article says that he seeks to develop a partnership between the Institute and industry sponsors, so Big Pharma. He wants to identify and exploit scientific opportunities to accelerate HIV vaccine research. What might those be? Maybe populations of captive audiences? Maybe going into countries in Africa where the people can't defend themselves? And he seeks to strengthen collaborative interactions with other public and private organizations. Like who? Possibly the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? Organizations like that? Dr. Fauci is optimistic that a useful HIV vaccine can be developed despite economic, ethical, and cultural constraints. Well, yeah, it's easy to do when your wife is the head of bioethics and human subject research at the National Institute of Health. That sure does grease the wheels, doesn't it? So, yeah, I, excuse me, but I don't have a high opinion of Christine Grady's own ethics when she says, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. In this 2001 edition of Foreign Service Journal, they print her story. She writes it in and they print it. And in this very same edition, a Foreign Service Journal is another interesting article about technology and the UN High Commission on Refugees. It turns out that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave $600,000 and Microsoft Corporation gave software and laptops to the UN High Commission on Refugees who first took them to Kosovo to track the refugees and log them. And then they used version 2.0 after that in Senegal and New Delhi. It says here, in a speech at Microsoft headquarters last July, then Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees Rick Barton suggested that technology could help UNHCR, quote, move beyond just the care and maintenance of refugees to connect the diaspora of people who are influential in the development of post-conflict societies. Oh boy, that opens a whole can of worms. Do you remember my research on Project Aerodynamic, which was where the CIA identified a large diaspora community of Ukrainians that had come mostly to Canada? And the CIA moved in and used the fact that they were unassimilated and that they were kind of a, an island in itself, floating loosely. They could push them towards different political opinions and ideas. And also, they exploited the fact that these guys were traveling back and forth from Ukraine and other uh, Soviet bloc countries back to Canada, back and forth. They used them to pass messages. They used them to spread propaganda. They used to read their mail. They used them to bring things back and forth. They used them to recruit other spies in other areas. They were assets of the CIA. It was called Project Aerodynamic. I've covered it before in relation to Alexander Vindman and his family. Well, this... What I just showed you about Microsoft going in with their technology and logging and tracking and, and connecting the diaspora communities of, of refugees from all kinds of countries, that sounds like a high-tech version of aerodynamic to me. And the boom is, of course, that Anthony Fauci's wife, Christine Grady, is head of human subjects research and medical ethics at the National Institute of Health and was actually on the President's Medical Ethics Commission from 2010 to 2017. I mean, boom.